because I'd live and call rural, Can rural Canada home from coast to coast to coast. And rural communities have long been essential to Canada's economy and quality of life. And we're vital partners in building this country's future. All pandemic long, I've heard uh, and seen how hard rural leaders are working to keep people safe, even in the face of some really tough challenges. And I'm proud of the way FCM and the FCM Rural Forum has brought rural voices and rural priorities to Ottawa. From building a rural lens into the federal government to finally closing Canada's digital divide. I like the sound of that. And making progress on that too. This month's launch of an expanded universal broadband fund was a direct response to the relentless advocacy from rural leaders led by this rural forum. This is a huge win for rural communities, and I want to thank Minister Monsef for her partnership and determination to make this happen. And we'll hear in the discussion today a strong Canada depends on a strong rural Canada. Rural leaders are ready to help drive Canada's COVID-19 recovery, and we're ready to roll up our sleeves and get down to work. Because as rural Canadians and as frontline governments, that's what we do best. So I'd like to turn it over now to FCM's uh, third Vice President, Scott Pierce, to introduce our guest speaker. Just a reminder that Scott will speak in French, and simultaneous interpretation is available if you need it. Scott? Merci, Ray, uh, et bonjour. Uh... Thank you, Ray. And hi, uh, everyone. As a third vice president, uh, newly elected to FCM, I can tell you that I am determined to be a strong voice for rural communities in the country. And I intend to collaborate closely with our guest. As Minister for Rural Economic Development, uh, Madame Monsef knows how essential rural municipalities are uh, since the start of the pandemic. Pandemic, Minister Monsef and her government work closely with FCM to support our rural communities, our frontline workers, and our regional industries. And this, among other things, thanks to the Universal Broadband Fund, which was expanded this month, as our chair just mentioned. The pandemic clearly illustrated the urgency of filling the digital gap so that everyone can have access to high-speed internet as soon as possible. While millions of Canadians turn to their computer to work, study, and stay in touch, an incredible number of other citizens were not as lucky. All municipalities must have access to high-speed internet because we must all have the same tools to thrive, no matter where we live. FCM stands ready to work with the minister so that the funds can be distributed quickly and efficiently. We are also ready to address the appropriate challenges to build dynamic communities and therefore an even stronger Canada. For Rural Economic Development, the Honourable Miriam Monsef. Merci, Scott. Bonjour. Thank Anine. you, Scott. Hi. Salam alaikum. It is so good to be back with friends and colleagues in the FCM uh, Rural Forum. Uh, Ray Orb, it is always a pleasure to be in the same space as you virtually or not. Uh, I remember our first meeting with the Rural Forum. It was in Ottawa. It was the day after being sworn in. And you folks were impressive. Your needs were uh, well articulated. The people who've sent you to Ottawa, the people who have that day leaving that conversation with you and thinking how incredible it is that in this big, beautiful country, despite all our differences, despite the differences in geography, in languages, in cultures, how we are united in so many ways and how particularly for rural communities, for smaller communities, we have more in common with each other than we do sometimes with the nearest urban centers. And that holds us all together. So I, I want to thank you for your continued advocacy for all the difficult work you have taken on, knowingly putting your name on a ballot, and then all the ways that life and work has been difficult because of COVID, and all the ways that you have persevered 
despite those challenges. I don't think any of us could have predicted what 2020 would have brought uh, when we last met, but it is inspiring to see how well municipalities are pivoting and how responsive you've been. I hope you're doing okay. I hope you are safe. I hope your loved ones are okay. And I sure hope that your teams are okay because this year may be coming to an end. The difficulties behind us have taken a toll on all of us, but there is more hard work ahead of us with responding to COVID, with keeping our communities safe, with vaccine delivery, and of course, with building back together uh, stronger communities across the country. Particular shout out to the moms on, on this call and the daughters on this call. All the data is telling us that you're taking on additional responsibilities and we really hope that you're doing okay too. We're here for you. Uh, Mr. President, I wanna talk about two things in my opening remarks and then I'm very much looking forward to the stories and the discussion. One, how valuable the partnership with FCM and with municipalities has been. And two, the vitality and the importance of our connections. You asked us for a rural lens. We developed it with you. We are applying it and it is helping us in our response to COVID. It will help us with our recovery. You asked for a rural lens. We have one now. You asked to have a minister responsible for rural economic development. My predecessor, Bernadette Jordan, was the first in that role. I'm the second, and it's an honor to serve you within the cabinet. You asked for a separate stream for rural infrastructure in the broader infrastructure uh, plan that our government put forward. We listened. You asked for smaller communities with smaller populations to be considered. They are now. And those funds are being rolled out in partnership with provinces, in partnership with municipalities as we speak. The timeline for those application processes uh, is six weeks between when we get the complete application and when we get it out there. Six weeks. You asked for it. We delivered. You asked for rural broadband colleagues and you got it. You asked for flexibility and we listened. You asked for last mile backbone as well as a pathfinder service. You got it. You asked for us to go back to the smart tradition of collecting rural data. We did it. We're doing it. And we're also collecting data for the rural broadband fund. You asked us to double the gas tax and to support you with that work. We listened. You asked us to apply a rural lens to our green uh, recovery plan. We listened. Why do I say all this? Why do I remind you of all this? I, I know that your work involves a lot of advocacy. It involves a lot of hard days and it involves a lot of hard work. I ran for mayor uh, before I ran federally. I came very close to winning. I understand that you are on the front lines and especially right now, there aren't that many wins. I want to remind you of how effective your advocacy has been and how important your victories have been and how we are moving forward together in a good way. And as I sit here in my basement in Peterborough, Ontario, on Williams Treaty territory, uh, I am able to connect with smart, thoughtful people like you across the country. Those connections are made possible because of our internet access, some of us better than others. Those connections have been the strength of our response to COVID. And those connections are going to be essential to our ability to get through this winter and to build back better, build back together on the other side of COVID. And I'll wrap up with this. I am very much uh, thankful for the opportunity to hear some of the stories you're about to share. Those stories, nothing connects humans better than the power of stories. And I appreciate everybody who's shown up. I see some of the faces in, in, in the virtual room here uh, who's shown up to hear and share some of those stories too. Thanks very much, uh, Minister Monsef, for those kind remarks. And I, I, I say I, I speak for everyone here to, you know, that thanks you for not only your kind remarks, but the hard work that you've done on this file. We really appreciate it. So we're going to hear some of those stories. 
Uh, first of all, we're going to hear from a young lady by the name of Ashley Whedon. Uh, she is a she uh, is a PhD candidate at the University of Gulf and a tireless advocate for rural Canada. Ashley. Thank you so much for having me, uh, Ray, Minister Monsef, and the whole FCM team. Um, some of the names in the participant list are familiar to me from my previous life working in local government, and I'm a long time uh, sort of FCM uh, fangirl, although I worked on the staff. I, I got to work with a number of the, the faces and voices I hear in this room or this virtual room today on a variety of projects. So it's just a, a delight and an honor to be here to talk about something that I know we're all passionate about, which is the future of rural Canada. So. Um, recognizing that uh, in all of the work that I do and all of the work that you do, place matters, you know, places where uh, our identities are formed, it's where services are delivered or sometimes not delivered, and it's where we put into practice our ideals of governance and see if they actually work in the real world. So place matters despite the fact that we're able to connect virtually and there are arguments about a compressed 21st century in which borders no longer matter. We choose to live or we end up living somewhere for a long variety of reasons. And recognizing the importance of place just before I talk a little bit about the future, sort of integrating some of these acknowledgements around um, our commitment to both each other and to the land that we call home I just would invite everyone to reflect a little bit on the land that they have a relationship with and the way that I was taught to do land acknowledgements is to make that personal. And also recognizing that today is the International Day to End Violence Against Women. And so in lieu of a sort of more traditional land acknowledgement, I wanted to read a short poem by Daniel David Mo Moses called The Essay on the Problem of Sky Woman. So how did it happen? In all likelihood, she fell. Well, that's how it's usually told. Women have accidents, they say. Girls slip up, fall down. Oops. But do we really dare say such about her? She's not just any woman. If she wasn't, then she's become now. She fell is too simple. So you're saying what? She was pushed? Well, do they talk at all about a husband? No. As they don't specify her condition, knowing her by her reputation, even in that condition, he might have. We're discounting impossibility that maybe nothing happened, that perhaps her existence is a myth. Yes, because Turtle Island's here and continental drift is insufficient to the cause of us inhabiting it and null is dull. Let us imagine glancing down and peering down through the hole, seeing that strange water world, waves, shadows we later learn our wings. Imagine her stopped, calculating how far the fall might be, the panic that clenched her gut gone away. Curiosity. It's now clear that our options are two. Who was she? The woman who jumped or the one who got pushed? That difference is the one that matters. Does the mystery work from the outside in or from the inside out? That's the one philosophical question. And this poem is powerful to me, not only when I think about our missing and murdered indigenous women, about violence against women in general across Canada and that we know that rural women are particularly vulnerable to that, but also in relationship to place. The way we talk about rural places is often framed as if there is something broken with them, that they need to be fixed by outside forces, that they are cities lying in wait or just sort of failed experiments in urbanism. And for me, when I sat and was reflecting on this poem as I was preparing for today, the thing that kind of kept coming clear to me was that none of that holds true to me. How we determine our stories and how we think about the future of rural Canada really depends on where we find our center and where we find place. Your experience of the core and the periphery is all determined on your position. And for us in rural Canada, our core, our center is in our communities. That's the center of my universe. My heart lives in my community. And the more that I ground myself and I see you doing the same in the realities and needs, wants, aspirations of my community, rather than trying to be somewhere else, the better that place becomes and the more part of it I become. And so as I think about the future and as the stories we're going to hear, you know, when we're preparing for this panel and hearing from these great examples of uh, not only of resilience and innovation, but also forward thinking from leaders across this country. And the thing that became most clear to me was that when we stop trying to become a, like uh, the next Silicon Valley. I think Mike Moffat put out a great uh, satirical thread of tweets around a tech hub for Tilsonburg and about how we somehow have bought into this idea that we all need to be the same in order to be successful. 
the more we lean into place and think about place-based assets, place-based needs, and the realities of our relationships to each other, uh, to the land, and to our responsibilities to take care of each other, the better off we'll be. So throughout this, this, this event that we're holding today, you'll hear stories and in conversation with myself and Minister Monsef, which I'm just delighted to be here for, about all of the ways that the unglamorous work of care and maintenance actually is the thing that will lead us into the future. Taking care of each other, investing in infrastructure, and thinking really hard and long and, and embracing that productive pause about who we want to be as we move forward. If there can be only one lesson from this pandemic for me for rural communities is that we've, we finally understood that we're not all in the same boat, we're all in the same storm. And so how do we manage to take care of those different vessels that might be at a different stage than we are? And for mine, I return back to that, which is the future of rural is in place. And so let's make place-based policy a reality here in Canada. So thank you so much for having me. I'm so looking forward to this conversation and I'll turn it back over to you, Ray. Thanks very much, uh, Ashley. Appreciate your comments, certainly. So we are gonna have um, three exciting panelists coming up next and each panel will present an important issue facing rural Canada. Infrastructure's role in the recovery is the first one. The second one is broadband as a key driver of economic recovery. And finally, the future of Main Street and local tourism. Following the short presentations, uh, Minister Monsef and Ashley will have the opportunity to discuss what the government is currently doing in this area and uh, how this fits in within the future of rural. So first we have Anne Lisa Jensen, who is a counselor in Parkland County, Alberta, here to discuss infrastructure's role in their recovery. Anne Lisa, go ahead, please. Good afternoon and thank you, Ray and Scott, uh, for your moderation today and welcome to my fellow panelists, Minister Monsef, Ashley, what a wonderful, inspiring start and thank you both. Your involvement is so appreciated. It's truly a privilege to participate today and it's my honor to serve as the representative for rural Alberta on the FCM Board of Directors and to speak about rural infrastructure on the panel today. So municipalities own 60% of public infrastructure and it requires continued renewal. We are all aware of the significant infrastructure deficit nationwide in both urban and rural municipalities. According to the Conference Board of Canada, every dollar invested in local infrastructure boosts Canada's real domestic product by $1.20 to $1.60. Investing in infrastructure is a proven stimulus strategy, but it's more than that. It's also the foundation for more inclusive, green and resilient communities. It is necessary to support the economy, enabling resource access and movement of goods, services and people. Community infrastructure like seniors and recreation centers, parks and libraries brings people together. And in Alberta, rural municipalities manage road infrastructure. The majority of roads, 77%, or just under 175,000 kilometers, 8,500 bridges and culverts, which is 61% of them. At a cost of between 500,000 and a million dollars to construct one kilometer of road, and a similar cost to construct a bridge or culvert, the cost of managing transportation infrastructure form a significant portion of rural municipal expenses. Beyond roads and bridges, municipalities are also responsible for other necessary infrastructure, including water, wastewater, and in some cases, additional supports for services in urban areas. As road infrastructure is essential for Alberta's economy, some municipalities contribute funding when possible to support investment in those provincial highways. And to provide some examples of rural infrastructure, specifically around transportation, I'd like to share some stories from around Alberta. In February of this year, the MD of Greenview Council approved the expenditure of up to 50% of project costs for the twinning of the provincially owned Highway 40 for approximately 20 kilometers to enable the province to move forward with their investment in this needed road infrastructure. This investment was also supported by the County of Grand Prairie, who acknowledges the need to partner to fund these upgrades to improve public safety in a key transportation link. Investment for infrastructure in Indigenous communities, including road and bridge infrastructure and water lines, is also prevalent in Alberta's rural municipalities. Pinoka County has invested in the reconstruction of a bridge and resurfacing of a road that connects the county with Montana First Nation to support long-term investment in this road infrastructure and provide safe access for the public. The Bonneville, Bonneville Regional Water Services Commission has been progressing 
on a project to enable interbasin transfer of water to provide potable water to Frog Lake First Nations. These infrastructure investments are essential to supporting the economy and enabling the safety of the public. The importance of federal and provincial partnership in supporting these investments to serve all Albertans continues and it's essential as we continue to navigate the pandemic and transition to recovery. On June 1st of this year, the Government of Canada announced that the allocation of $2.2 billion under the federal gas tax fund would be accelerated this year and provided in a single payment in June to help Canadian communities recover from the COVID-19 pandemic as quickly as possible while respecting public health guidelines. For Alberta, this translated into approximately $244 million flowing through the gas tax fund earlier to support local infrastructure priorities. In late July, the Alberta government announced the Municipal Stimulus Program to support municipal capital infrastructure projects as a means to contribute to local job creation and economic recovery. The program includes $500 million in funding to be distributed to all municipalities in Alberta based on the existing gas tax fund allocation formula. These investments from the federal and provincial governments combined with municipal dollars have enabled Alberta's rural municipalities to continue to plan and invest in infrastructure projects during this challenging economic time, supporting the path to recovery. The pandemic has highlighted the impacts that isolation and economic challenges has on mental well-being and infrastructure investment should be viewed as more than just building physical things. These investments support economic activities, but also enable Alberta's residents to access health professionals and other necessary services such as financial institutions and support services and to connect people physically with their neighbors, friends and family. As part of the federal government's plan to transition to net zero GHG emissions by 2050, FCM's Western Economic Solutions Task Force is calling for the creation of a new energy transition community infrastructure fund that helps municipalities and energy producing regions diversify their economies by investing in local and regional infrastructure projects. These examples demonstrate how investing in infrastructure can be a centerpiece of an inclusive and absolutely where possible green recovery. Local governments know better than anyone where that investment is needed in our communities. Rural communities have unique needs with regard to infrastructure and it is critically important to have streamlined application processes or better yet, direct funding. So thank you for the opportunity to present around infrastructure and I do have the opportunity, I understand to ask a question of each of you, if that's all right, uh, beginning with the minister. Um, how do you see your government working with municipalities and rural communities in particular to rebuild our economies through infrastructure investment? Annalisa, thank you so much. That was, that was a trip down many roads I'm not <laughs> able to take on my own right now and your words so beautifully allowed me to do that, just as Ashley's beautiful words uh, took us all to a very good place uh, and centered us as, mm -hmm. as, as disconnected as we are right now uh, towards a common goal. Um, Ashley mentioned places and how these places are more than just bricks and mortar, as you did, Annalisa. These, these places are vital to our histories, to our traditions, to, to the character and to the identities of, of our peoples. Uh, one of the reasons I, I became politicized, if, if I can call it that, is one of the local schools in my community was going to be shut down. And this school was more than a school. It was filled with memories. It allowed for a safe place for people who were a little different and immobilized the community in a way that, you know, garnered national media attention. Place matters. So do people. And so do partnerships. And those three P's are what the rural economic development strategy that the government of Canada put forward uh, are based upon. Places, people, and partnerships. So how does infrastructure play in, in all of this? This was part of our 2015 uh, commitment to Canadians that if a liberal government came into power, we would put forward $180 billion, the single largest investment in infrastructure in Canada's history, and that we would partner with communities to do that. Annalisa, you're absolutely right. Communities know best what they need. Communities know best what the shortcuts are. And communities have done an amazing job stretching every single dollar to its maximum potential. 
and the proof is in the pudding. We we formed a partnership uh, with municipalities early on, and you're delivering for us. If I look at uh, the two programs that we have right now that are being delivered by FCM, the Municipal Asset Management Program and the Municipalities for Climate Innovation Program, you know, collectively, over a thousand projects have been funded through this partnership. Close to 800 municipalities and First Nation communities are benefiting. And you've proven to be really effective delivery partners for us. In addition to the delivery mechanism, municipalities have also been key in shaping the program design. You told us you wanted flexibility. You got it. You said that our infrastructure program should also include broadband and cell uh, eligibility. So if a community has, a, you know, nominated a project to be specifically for connectivity, it should qualify. We listened. You asked us to ensure that we're taking into account the needs around water and wastewater. We did that. And we're going to continue down this path because it's working. I will say uh, one piece, which relates to, to Ashley's wonderful opening too. Physical infrastructure matters. It is key. I hope that as municipal, as municipal leaders, we start to hear more from you about social infrastructure. Social infrastructure is housing, which I saw is in your report. Social infrastructure is early learning and childcare. Social infrastructure is those supports for women and children fleeing violence and abuse. And those social infrastructures, they actually hold the economy together. You know, they're the long-term care homes. They're, they're the places where care is needed so that other people can go to work knowing that their loved ones are looked after. That social infrastructure is going to be key for rural Canada. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll end your, your question with this, Annalisa. When the pandemic hit and we realized that we were going to go into a, a recession, um, I look back into the lessons learned from the 2008 recession. The truth is, rural Canada never fully recovered from the 2008 recession. When there was economic growth, 98% of that growth was in Toronto. And that's a good thing. That's a great thing. But I drive up and down Highway 7 as my way of getting back and forth from Peterborough to Ottawa. And I see beautiful communities, beautiful places hollowed out because investments did not take into account the long-term needs of the communities. Because we forgot that the people in those places need that social infrastructure. And rural women with children never fully recovered. And that's a mistake we are determined not to repeat. Thanks Thank very you. much, uh, at least for, for posing those questions and uh, Minister Monsef for answering. Ashley, I'll go to you quickly. Uh, try and keep your uh, remarks to uh, under three minutes. So we're a little bit uh, pressed for time. We just have to be conscious of that. Thanks. Absolutely. So again, thank you to Annalise for those fabulous stories of, of initiatives of becoming uh, out of rural communities to address these uh, issues that we see facing us around infrastructure. And the things that came out to me through those stories, and I'm thinking about this as we um, prepped, is that um, I, I've been working and reading my way through uh, uh, the work of a philosopher from Oxford called Tony Orb, who calls the current age that we're in right now the precipice. And so um, this is predicated on the idea of what we do now will determine kind of the weight of human future it, uh, for all time and not to put too much pressure on the people in this room, but you are stewards of some of those decisions. So I think it's important that we sit and reflect on the reality of that. Um, I'm an infrastructure nerd uh, as well as a governance nerd. You almost exactly the dysfunction in your relationships on council, in your uh, municipality and between your local partners, depending on the state of your infrastructure. We are currently living in an age where we're dealing with the, dis the dysfunction and the cost of deferred decision-making and deferred investment on critical infrastructure, whether that's physical or social. What we're finding ourselves facing right now is that we can't defer those costs any longer. Um, just because something is expensive or because the conversation around how we negotiate those costs in our communities is uncomfortable, 
doesn't mean that we can shy away from those anymore. And if we do so, there are real social, economic, and environmental consequences, whether that's on green infrastructure, on housing, on the civic infrastructure that allows our governance to work, or on the physical infrastructure that connects us. So what we need to do in terms of moving towards a future that we all want to live in is build towards this idea around collaboration, community-driven priorities, and getting really honest about what we can sustain and what we want to sustain and how we can get there. The age where every rural community is going to have its own water treatment plant is probably over. The age where even every rural community is going to have its own arena may actually be over because we're seeing this issue around what can we sustain, what makes sense for our communities, and then how do we handle those conversations in a way that respects the needs and wants of our people. So in order to do that, people in this room, uh, your next task is actually to embrace a bit of a pause and to move from shovel-ready projects into shovel-worthy projects, which is a line I'm stealing from the wonderful Sean Markey at SFU. So we really need to think about what are we investing our time and resources in in order to get off that precipice and move into a better future? Thanks very much, Ashley. I'm going to pass it over to Susan Hewitt, the mayor of Caslow, BC, to give uh, us a presentation on their innovative local broadband work. But I'm just going to mention uh, that we had some inquiries. Uh, if you have a question, you want to put it into the chat, uh, and we'll make sure that uh, the uh, speakers can get back to you at a later date. So thank you. Susan? Well, thank you, Ray and, uh, and Scott and my fellow panelists. I'm very happy to be part of FCM's first ever all-female panel. Um, Minister Monsef, I would like to express my sincere appreciation for your government, to your government for the recently announced Universal Broadband Fund. This year has shown that reliable broadband is critically important to the survival of small communities across this country. Small businesses need to be able to compete with their large competitors across the country when in-person shopping options are limited. This week has shown that using the internet, we can keep in touch and has provided a forum for local government leaders to share ideas and best practices with their colleagues. The playing field is not level, however, and the village of Caslow and our rural counterparts in Area D of the Regional District of Central Kootenai would like to see all rural areas across the country enjoy the same level of service that we currently enjoy. Our success is largely due to the Columbia Basin Trust, or CBT, who identified access to broadband as one of their priorities and formed the Columbia Broadband Corporation it to assist in delivering on that priority. In 2012, the village of Caslow, along with many other basin local governments, was approached by CBBC with a proposal to bring 100 megabyte per second fiber link to their communities if they would provide the last mile fiber network. At that time, Caslow was the only community to sign up for this program. As a small community, we realized the value of the opportunity and quickly formed a committee to see how this could be achieved. This is when the Caslow Infonet Society, our local not-for-profit internet service providers stepped up. They worked with the other committee members consisting of members of council and the Chamber of Commerce to develop a fiber deployment and they were instrumental in putting that plan into action. KIN was formed in the 1990s with a focus on serving the 24 unincorporated communities surrounding Caslow since the existing internet provider was unwilling to serve them due to their rural populations. With $94,000 obtained through a combination of their own funds and grants provided by the Village of Caslow and the Southern Interior Development Initiative Trust, they were able to develop a buried fiber network to serve downtown Castle. The point of presence was installed in the basement of the municipally owned Campbell Memorial Center, which is located in the downtown core. 
During this process, Quick Kin quickly determined that being dependent upon pole infrastructure was not the solution and it was very costly to maintain. So they did their research and put some innovative solutions into place. This research determined that the best, best place for fiber was in the ground and the least expensive place for long haul fiber was under the water. Since the initial build out, Kin has continued to construct the network in our area and they have received approximately $1.5 million in grants and have invested nearly half a million dollars through debenture funding. In recent years, they have had sales of $650,000 with operating costs of $450,000, which have largely been spent in the local community on, and on continued expansion. Once they reach full build out, revenues are expected to exceed a million dollars annually. Got too many mouses going here. <laughs> Uh, Kin currently employs 4.5 employees on a full-time basis, year-round basis, and the same number of staff are added in the summer construction season. And their current minimum hourly wage for all employees is $24 an hour, which is very good for a small rural community. They currently have about 700 active subscribers. They expect that it will be possible to have gigabit fiber service available to all residents of Castle and Area D within the next three years. Opportunities currently underway are an innovation center in our Kemble building with Kin providing a free network and the BC Rural Center will be using Caslo as a pilot for their virtual health hub. Kin continues to look for ways to improve the services that they provide to our communities. They would be happy to share the lessons they've learned with other local government leaders across Canada and provide assistance in the rollout. I have received permission from, from Kin to share with FCM staff a document they developed called the Caslo Cookbook, which shares the story of Kin's evolution and how they've rolled out service for this area. And thank you for the opportunity to make this presentation to you today. Yeah, thanks uh, very much, Suzanne. Um, in the interest of time, I know we, we have one more speaker and I'm a little bit concerned we might run out of time. So uh, Minister Monsef and Ashley, be okay if you could hold your remarks to the end and then we can, uh, we can uh, collaborate towards the end of the session. I'm going to ask uh, Kathy Jeffrey, who is a counselor uh, with the town of Collingwood, Ontario, to share what her community is doing to ensure that Main Streets remain alive and thriving. Kathy? Thank you very much, Chair Orb, and good afternoon, Minister Monsef, Ashley, and colleagues. It's wonderful to have the Minister and Ashley here to give us their insights on some critical rural um, initiatives. The town of Collingwood, Ontario, is a population approximately 25,000, is located on the waterfront of Georgian Bay, Lake Huron, and it's nestled between the finest skiing and mountain biking in Ontario and the longest freshwater beach in the world. The municipal trail system is a gem and connects our town with the region. And Collingwood boasts a fantastic wide and beautiful main street and is proud and protective of its heritage conservation district. The municipality embraced tourism to fuel its local economy in the mid 80s when um, it lost thousands of jobs in the shipbuilding and manufacturing sectors. More recently, the town has been recognized as the number one entrepreneurial community uh, in Canada and in the top three of the best places to live in Canada. It is known nationally and internationally for its event-based tourism. So what possibly could go wrong? Well, COVID-19 flatlined many of our community's businesses, particularly tourism, and continues to have a devastating impact. Local business is key to the success of rural communities providing jobs and tax revenue locally. If too many fail, it will bring a lot of hardship to our community for the foreseeable future. The pandemic exposed significant vulnerabilities in our town, 
it became obvious that we needed to find a way to transition from how we did business pre-COVID to preserve our businesses and remain a vibrant and much desired community. During the pandemic, we found ourselves inundated by throngs of non-residents from large urban centers, depleting our social distancing space in our trails and parks and depleting our food sources. It seemed counterintuitive to ask non-residents to quarantine where they live, and we worry about the backlash of that message post-COVID, but our community safety is our highest priority. The old downtown historic buildings present its business owners and tenants with spatial challenges. Data was unavailable to determine a baseline upon which to monitor the town's economic performance during the pandemic and post-pandemic. It had insufficient resources for a substantially needed digital Main Street program to assist the number of business owners who did not have a web presence or e-commerce option for their businesses. The town deferred property tax payments, provided parking and public transit free, and it became obvious pretty quickly that the municipality couldn't assist businesses financially. And if it did so, it was at the peril of not meeting its legislative responsibilities. Astute business owners as volunteers provided significant input, which combined with an awesome marketing and uh, business development department, led to council finalization of three components that make up our critical path to recovery and resiliency. The economic action plan, the tourism strategy, and the economic support and recovery task force recommendations, which culminated in an ambitious and positive path forward, including uh, building metrics to measure our success and impact of initiatives, focusing on the critical few, supported with a dashboard and set targets ensuring that all businesses have access to the appropriate government, federal, provincial, county, and municipal funds and collaborative, uh, collaborate with business associations to deliver this. Drive a long-term marketing promotional plan that complements our strategic plan to ensure Collingwood remains a top of mind four season destination. Moving from more visitors to visitors who spend more on quality experiences that are built on our unique offerings. Marrying the idea of tourism businesses with startups and business development. This means that we can develop more owners entrepreneurs and require less service people making minimum wage. Strengthening and leveraging the cultural fabric of the community as a healing agent and inspiration for economic resurgence with low cost, high volume events high value events, sorry. By marketing our tourism experiences primarily to our residents and local regional folks, we still have wonderful, colorful campaigns, but we are spending less on conventional media for the greater Toronto area while building our local pride and resilience. Similar to other communities, the town expanded patios into parking space on, on main and side streets in the downtown, closed one block of a side street and created a patio delicious event to promote our local restaurants and bars. Shortly, snow removal and winter weather will limit those options immensely. And access to resources that enable people to support one another, increase control over their health and build an equitable, vibrant and economically prosperous community. Uh, you should see a couple of links for further information uh, in the chat box. Um, it will take all orders of government working together to support the rural economy's recovery and to provide resiliency for the future. And that brings us to the Q&A for this panel. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Kathy. That was a, that was a great story. Minister Mansef, I'll, I'll, I'll go to you first uh, if uh, you'd like to make some remarks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ray. And thank you, uh, Your Worship, Mayor Hewitt and, and Councillor Jeffrey for sharing your stories. Uh, it goes back to what Ashley said, that pride in place. Uh, I can hear it in, in every word that you shared. Uh, I think the the point that that Mayor Hewitt made is an important one, and I'll emphasize it on the broadband fund. And I see uh, Rebecca, Leah and Gord referred to this in the chat box. On the broadband fund, the plan that we delivered is the one that you asked for. And the ball is now in your court. And I totally understand that 60% of municipalities have fewer than five staff supporting the very important work doing the heavy lifting. And we heard from you loud and clear that, you know, it's good to have those dollars, but it is also essential 
to provide support and capacity to help you get at those dollars. So with the broadband fund, when I say the ball's in your court, it means, you know, and my team is going to post shortly the, the link and the 1-800 number that you can call to access the Pathfinder service. And this is a group of really smart, thoughtful engineers, project managers, from the government of Canada, some of my officials are here right now, who will pick up the phone and help you navigate this very complex process, because we get it, you've got a lot on your plate. But this uh, internet access piece is essential. So whether you need access to our maps, the hexagon models is gone, by the way, our maps are more precise, whether it's you need help with with the engineering connections, if you need help connecting to others in your surrounding, who perhaps are about to go forward with the same pursuit of connectivity, we are here to facilitate those connections. And and to do some of the handholding that you asked us for in the pursuit of these dollars. These dollars are available now. $150 million is available right now for the rapid response stream. This is for projects that can improve connectivity to 5010 or higher over the next year. Uh, the application deadline for those for that rapid response stream is January 15th. And I promise you that the people we have ready to receive those applications will process them within a matter of days so that you have the, the certainty and the confidence that you need to go into December, to go into Christmas or Hanukkah or Kwanzaa or just the nice long uh, winter solstice. Uh, we're ready to process those within days. The other uh, more longer term projects, uh, that those funds are available now too. And we will do the same handholding and the same pathfinding, uh, pathfinding. and uh, Mayor Hewitt's uh, cookbook is a really smart way of sharing best practices to get that connectivity. We're ready to go. We're ready to support you. Reach out to us, please. Uh, and we will be there to support you. The Universal Broadband Fund website is one way to do it. If you're on this call, you have internet, but we'll also uh, have people on standby at 1-800-328-6189 eight, nine, who can help navigate the complex process for you. And that relates to that also relates to uh, the the point that uh, Councillor Jeffrey made about digital Main Street. There are funds available right now, and Ma Minister Mary Ng uh, put them forward early on in the pandemic for those businesses that were ready to go digital. Uh, funds are available, and we, for example, Chambers of Commerce were among those that we partnered with to deliver those dollars. We get that a business loss in a smaller community has a much bigger impact than a business in for that community than a business loss in a larger community. But at the end of the day, it's a family's livelihood that's affected. It is the tax base of the municipality that's affected. And then all the things that we can't put words to or quantify that are lost and affected when these smaller businesses go, go, go under. And so what Minister Freeland did with the new bill she proposed in the House of Commons which got support uh, earlier this week, we, we received notice that it's good to go. And, and once it is the law of the land, we'll be able to roll out additional support for small businesses. These small businesses now have the opportunity to, you know, go back to their rent costs being covered back to September. Uh, the wage subsidy is already there as a lifeline. Uh, the smaller businesses in smaller communities like mine, Community Futures, uh, have been uh, selected as partners through Minister Jolie's office so that those smaller targeted grants and loans go where they need to. We, we will be there to keep these businesses viable. And we will be there, of course, to tweak our programs. I think I think that's one of the things that Canadians appreciate is throughout COVID particularly, when you told us to act with speed and to perfect later. And so as you give us feedback, we tweak these programs because ultimately they are for you. They are for you and they are for our country and they are for our future. And if they're not working or they could be better, we are hearing you, we're listening and we're delivering. It will be a very long winter. It will be a difficult winter, but we are in it together. 
And of course, you know, in my community, as is the case across the country, we're encouraging a buy local uh, initiative. Those smaller businesses have, have had a really tough time throughout COVID. And I, I sincerely hope that we're all doing everything we can to support them throughout this holiday season and beyond. The government of Canada will be there, of course, but they need to know that they are not alone. Thanks very much. Uh, Ashley, I'll turn it over to you, but the interest of time, try to keep it under. I know I'm always rushing you. It seems uh, three minutes would be about uh, about the right, I think. Thanks. Right. So uh, on the broadband front, uh, those of you who may know me from a previous life uh, know that this is something that's been dear, near and dear to my work for a number of years now, going on almost 10. Um, and uh, while uh, I'm grateful for the announcements of more funding, I think that we have fundamental issues in the way that um, broadband infrastructure is regulated, governed and implemented that will require a concerted effort over the coming years if we're truly going to change the game on rural broadband. Um, and uh, the thing that I can say about the future there is uh, imagine what we will do with our time when we don't have to be angry about rural broadband anymore. Um, I feel like this is a, a fight that has been going on uh, for generations now. It's certainly been a policy issue for my entire life. I'm 34. This has been going on since the early 80s. Um, and imagine what we will do with uh, pardon the pun, our bandwidth when we can focus on other issues in our community. We wouldn't say, come to our community, we have working roads and water. Um, why do we say that with broadband? So that's my uh, kind of slightly pointed bit on the broadband infrastructure conversation. When it comes to supporting Main Street and what it looks like for local economic development in our communities is that for two things, I think the future of Main Street development and as proven by our all woman panel today is inclusive. It's going to look different than what we think it looks like now. Um, just for reference, I'm wearing a wonderful shirt that says a woman's place is in the legislature, in the council chambers and in the in parliament made by Banan Premier out of Calgary, a woman owned business. And I'm wearing, everyone always comments on my lipstick. I'm wearing cheekbone lipstick, which is an indigenous woman owned uh, beauty company out of um, Western Canada that is also a bit of a social enterprise. And these two companies for me, there's a reason why I've chosen to invest my dollars there. It's I believe in the work that they're doing. And our local businesses, it's, it's really great for us to suggest that we need to encourage buying local, but we also need to encourage our local businesses that they are part of the community. They're not separate from the community. And we see that through sponsoring hockey teams or contributing to food drives. But in terms of the actual governance and the future direction of our community, just like we can't sit back as leaders at the council table or in staff and say it's someone else's problem, we really need to work with our local businesses around what their value proposition is to the community beyond just a price point. Because right now we're hearing a lot of things around it's more expensive what I need. I live in a place where I definitely can't get Uber. So we do all of our, our takeout um, uh, delivery uh, direct from a, from a restaurant right now. And in those places, we really need to work with people around why should I pick this instead of something else? There are a lot of reasons why people actually do go with the axis of evil, if we want to call Amazon that. And that's because parts of our country can't get goods and services delivered from any other service provider or it's simply cost prohibitive to do so. So we need to come up with an arrangement around how we work at economic development that confronts what I mentioned earlier around getting away from the precipice. What is our social contract to each other? What is our environmental contract to each other? And what is my responsibility to my community? How do I show up for them? And part of the way that we do that is by having these honest conversations around what do people need and how do we get there? So I like to end with this by saying, you know, a lot of the principles of rural economic development are actually need to be flipped on their head. We don't need to chase more businesses or more people or more visitors. And certainly right now that's actually kind of dangerous. What we really need to do is apply the same school of thought that works when you're seeking a romantic partner or a friend. No one likes a desperate person. No one wants to be with the person that says, come hang out with me, I'm the best. Instead, what we need to do is treat the people who already love us with absolute care and concern and affection and love. Our communities need our love. And if we invest that in the people who have already proven that they want to be here, that they've hung through difficult times and they're continuing to do that, that becomes attractive to others over time. So 
my advice there as we as we leave as we count down i'm giving you two minutes to the end of it ray is really is to think about what would an expression of love for my community look like when i'm thinking about the businesses and the residents that call this place home and put this at the center of their universe as well. So thank you so much to all of our panelists for such great stories and to Minister Monsef for her thoughtful comments on behalf of the government as well. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for your remarks as well, Ashley. Uh, I must say it was nice to meet you. I've never met you before, but uh, certainly hope that we can meet uh, more than virtually the next time. Uh, Minister Monsef, I can't thank you enough as well for being on this um, this call. And I usually do give you the last word, but you know what? We're going to be talking to you again soon. So I think we're going to reserve that, uh, that uh, talk for a later date. I'd like to thank Scott Pierce for being the co-host for this. This was great. I hope everyone enjoyed it. I'd like to thank as well, I am Lisa, for being on, uh, Suzanne, and for Kathy Jeffries as well. Uh, for helping us out today, telling the wonderful stories that they told. And uh, the uh, chat room was fairly active. And I know that uh, you both provided some information uh, to that. Everyone provided information to it. So we'll do the follow-up uh, as uh, we, we fit, see fit. And uh, thanks again. We're right on uh, the time limit. So I would bid everyone a good afternoon, uh, reminding everyone uh, that shortly we're going to be hearing from our final political keynote of the week, and that'll be Green Party leader Anna Mae Paul, and we don't want to miss that. So thanks again very much for being on time. We really appreciate it. All the best. Take care. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Bye. 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 Bye Thank you. Hello Hi. everyone, this is uh, FCM staff here and just as Ray mentioned, um, we're going to take a quick 15 minute break to uh, to reset before the keynote speaker, but it is on the same Zoom link so you could either stick around uh, on mute with your um, uh, take off and, and join back in in the next uh, 10 minutes please, thank you. They just, uh, they just sent out a notice today for uh, the uh, emergency services. I don't know. Mine was working. I'm sorry about that because it might have cut in the sound. <laughs>